I'm Stephanie Houck, and joining me today is Mr. John Skinner. It is April 8, 2010. Thank you, Mr. Skinner, for being with us today and sharing your memories. Well, thank you, <laughs> Stephanie. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Um, are you originally from Carroll County? No, I'm not. Um, my family, though, is an old family in Baltimore. As a matter of fact, um, our, Bible, our family Bible was at one time was the third oldest in Baltimore City. So uh, we have roots in Maryland that go back quite a ways. Um, and I would suspect um, we're from Charles County, and, okay. and we have Anne Arundel. But since um, Carroll County is so close, I wouldn't be surprised if there are family members in this area, too. I just wouldn't know them. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, when did you move to Carroll County? Okay. I came in uh, September of 1967 as a freshman at uh, Western Maryland College and of course the name uh, confused people back in Baltimore City. They thought I was out in Cumberland somewhere <laughs> but uh, in fact uh, you know, Westminster is only 30 miles away. Right. Um, and I, w I was here for four years. Uh, I graduated in June of 1971 with a physics major and math minor and I was completed the ROTC uh, course here, which was uh, mandatory when I first came. Oh, wow. Yes. I didn't know that was mandatory. Yes. Um, student, student protest changed a, changes a lot of things over the years. Um, that's good, but, though. That Most yeah. of the time, that's what it takes in order to kind of get changes. the ball rolling. Yeah. Yes. Um, was that the only activity you participated in, or? Well, no, actually. Um, I feel fortunate um, uh, Western Maryland McDaniel was such a small community that we had many opportunities to get involved in lots of things. And the main thing um, which helped my social integration on the campus was, uh, was sports. I mean, uh, we have this beautiful campus. I was a cross country runner in high school and a track runner. and. Uh, I was also, which I continued um, here, and I also was involved in choirs in my church choir, and I got involved with um, singing the Messiah here um, on oh. campus and at a local church. It was a combined um, campus and community choir. Um, oh wow! Uh, a lot so different from now. <laughs> yes, and it was a you know big production, and everyone in town came out to hear the. The featured soloist, uh, I even remember um, the uh, the tenor was a local delivery man. You know, he, he wow. was of Italian descent and, you know, he uh, just had the um, the tradition of singing in his culture. And uh, um, that's quite a challenging piece even for a, a trained musician. So for, for your local delivery guy to get up and sing the solo part is pretty <laughs> impressive. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's neat. Yeah. Um, so what brought you to Western Maryland College at that time? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I came in 67 when I came, there were um, the first wave of African American students had just come to campus uh, two years before, and that would be uh, Victor McTeer and mm -hmm. Joseph Smothers. Uh, a year after that, um, Charlene Williams, uh, and of course, so I thought that um, since Victor, Charlene, and I lived on the same street in Baltimore, Wheeler Avenue, within three blocks of each other. As a matter of fact, Charlene was about six houses away. You know, I thought Western Maryland was a, a well-integrated community. <laughs> and, uh, of course, when I got here, uh, there was a, just a handful of other uh, African-American students. Um, and the reason I came, um, I have an older brother who was two years ahead of me in college, and I uh, had won the Maryland State uh, uh, Scholarship. I had a good day taking the exam, I guess, and uh, I won the scholarship, and of course you can use that in the state of Maryland. So that, um, even though my, uh, that was a grand sum of $1,500, which was enough to pay the tuition at the time. Then I went to see my state senator, and she said, uh, John, John Skinner, uh, is, I know your dad. He teaches at Morgan. Um, um, 
you know, um, I'm going to have to cut your scholarship in half. Actually, I can send a student to the University of Maryland with the other half who wouldn't have an opportunity otherwise. And, you know, and I know your, your mom and dad can, uh, you know, can cover that. And so that's what she did. She told me right up front. And she knew my parents, too. <laughs> so, so, um, so arm of my half scholarship and, uh, and my uh, friend from Wheeler Avenue, I, I showed up in September of 1967. Okay. Um, how were you treated by the community and the college and everything around? Was it different from your home setting? or? That's an interesting question because... On a personal level, um, as I mentioned with the athletics, it gave a uh, male bonding type of thing. Um, so one of the first activities I got involved with was touch football. Um, we didn't even have a cross country team when I got here. I was part of the original cross country team about two years later. Um, so, um, so we had a formal schedule and we go out and we play games and uh, you know, and then, of course, being a physics major, uh, um, the rest of my time was really spent studying. Uh, a three-hour course meant three hours of study a week at that time, so um, I didn't have much free time beyond mm -hmm. the, uh, the activities, you know, initially. And, of course, also as a physics major, you have to take uh, chemistry for two years. Um, so my first two years were pretty busy uh, in the books. Right. Um, as far as the social integration goes, um, the campus uh, was small and very friendly, and there was not, um, I didn't feel any overt uh, discrimination. Um, however, um, we were at a time where uh, social integration amongst black and whites was uh, was kind of a new concept. I was just uh, checking back. It was in 1965. If you look uh, look online, uh, uh, Loving versus the United States. It was uh, the Supreme Court case mm -hmm. of a white man filed. Um, he was kicked out of his hometown, of Virginia, for living with his black wife. Uh, when the uh, when the police broke in. They were trying to catch them having sex, which was against the law in Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, against the miscegenation laws. And so they pointed on the wall to their marriage certificate, and they used that to um, prosecute them, saying that, it, that they were illegally married in Virginia. So as part of their plea, they fled to Washington, D.C. Um, to avoid further prosecution. And then a lawyer took on their case, and in 65, um, the Supreme Court overturned the right, um, the, the uh, statutes that um, made it illegal for blacks and whites to marry. So in that climate, of course, 65 was uh, my first year in high school, and I got here in 67. So um, there was the interracial dating that went on was still, um, there was, um, pressure, uh, there was social taboos associated with that, and, um, but as, as my son said, anytime you throw a bunch of young people together, <laughs> parties are liable to happen and, mm -hmm. and people get together. So, um, and that's what happened in Westminster, that uh, parties happened and friendships, um, interracial marriages. Um, formed out of friendships that happened here on campus. So, so there was tension in that sense. Um, there were not, there were three African American girls that came the same year I did. All three of them um, dropped out after the first year. And not for academic reasons, they just felt uncomfortable in the dorms and with the social situation. Um, and um, I remember uh, Dean Zepp uh, would bring us together and he'd ask us how we were doing, sort of like how you're asking me now. And, uh, you know, the girls would break down crying and I'm like, uh, I'm saying, oh, yeah, I was, I'm playing football, I'm running around the campus, you know, right. you know and uh, hanging out with the guys, you know, it's no big deal. Um, and they were crying. So 
so I probably need to tell you that to say that it wasn't, you know, an easy um, environment socially. Um, and because I had a difficult major, um, you know, I really didn't have a lot of time for socializing, number one. Number two, I had gone to an all-male school in Baltimore, Baltimore Polytechnic. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking back now, my social skills were probably not that, <laughs> that advanced anyway. Um, so the combination of things, yeah. Okay. Um, well, we kind of talked last night on the phone about, you said you lived through most, some of the most important events in the history of, you know, our country. Um, do you care to elaborate on them and kind of give your perspective yeah. at the time and then looking back now? Sure, and I think um, I kind of do it chronologically, but I think uh, all the major issues that are in the news today, a lot of them were formed, um, uh, were crystallized by um, student activism that occurred here and across the country because, um, you know, my group of baby boomers was and is 30% of the population. So, um, so I, I started with the uh, social integration um, and then, of course, we had um, the anti, the Vietnam War was on. Um, I had a draft number. Many of my classmates were uh, what we call um, draft induced um, uh, college students. <laughs> they were here to, as a way to avoid the draft, and they were not serious students. Uh, so they, they did as little as they could until, right. you know, so they could avoid um, being drafted. And having a draft number, you knew what your probabilities were. So basically, the draft number goes from 1 to 365, depending on the day you were born. And so you could look up your number. So if you were in the lower 100s, you had a very high probability of getting drafted, which meant going to Vietnam and fighting in the jungles, which is not, you know, um, was not that appealing. Um, for political reasons, um, most Americans didn't really understand what we were trying to accomplish there. And also for the fact that, you know, people were dying and not coming home alive. Um, I think the, the war effort at that time was crystallized in several events. Um, the massacre at Kent State and Jackson State occurred while I was on campus, which is probably the only time where we had at Kent State uh, the National Guard um, basically fired on college students and killed for them because they were protesting the Vietnam War. Uh, Jackson State, it was a, a similar type thing uh, of officials going in on a college campus. This was a black campus and basically killing students who were protesting the war. Uh, so that was, um, you know, one central issue uh, was overriding issue on this campus. And think about it, we had mandatory ROTC, I said. Right. So we would be out here drilling and uh, I remember um, behind uh, the dorm on the drill field here, and and some and every every week when we would drill, uh, someone would put a speaker in the window and play a, an anti-war song <laughs> while we were drilling. Uh, I don't know what we're fighting for. I don't know, but I don't give a damn. I don't want to go to Vietnam. You know that kind of stuff. And it was blasting, and you know, we're trying to learn our ROTC, and, and that's what we're listening to every week. Um, the, uh, another issue was, um, of course, um, the, the voting uh, rights, the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Act was 1965, and, um, uh, and of course, that's tied in with the social integration as well. Um, and then the women's movement. Um, Title IX, which m mandates um, equal spending for women's athletics in college, was enacted, I believe, in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and um, now the National Organization of Women was founded uh, during that time. So you really didn't have a concept of feminism before Gloria Steinem and, and others uh, defined it. Um, which um, 
again, uh, came out of our generation. The, another thing um, moving on was the environmental movement. The EPA was founded, um, again, in that, during that time period. Um, people were concerned, uh, today's news about the coal mining um, and environmental damage um, was part of the, the social uh, movement. Um, I guess it grew out of the anti-war feelings, um, basically um, what we call the hippie movement in Woodstock, and which was 69, I believe. Um, the environmental movement, the healthy foods movement, all that stuff started while we were on campus. I mean, and was basically invented by, by the young generation. Right. Um, and so I guess the other thing that I was thinking about that really rocked our, our lives at that time point were the assassinations, and this is the final thing. Uh, of course, the first one was uh, J John Kennedy in 1963. Well, that was the first time in television history that we had a murder alive on television. And guess what? The next day when the suspect, um, Lee Harvey Oswald, was brought into detention, Jack Ruby shoots him again. Again, that was on television live. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your, your whole sense of the country of having some sort of order, you know, not only can you kill a president on live TV, but then the suspect gets murdered in a police right. station before he even gets a fair trial. Uh, so that began a lot of cynicism and started fermenting a change of uh, views in the youth culture. Then the next two assassinations occurred, um, um, of course, was the Martin Luther King assassination, which was April of um, 1968. And then Robert Kennedy was June of 1968, like three months apart. And <coughs> uh, the Carroll County community, after the, um, the King assassination, there were riots in Baltimore and Washington. Uh, a lot of frustration was expressed. And the uh, grocery stores, uh, basically, the services were shut down temporarily. The National Guard was called in. So we organized drives on campus here, and uh, we loaded up the Volkswagen van um, and uh, rolled. Uh, I took two trips. I went to ba inner city Baltimore with one group and inner city Washington with another. Um, uh, and uh, we distributed food to the communities. Uh, so during that, um, so that, those were really the, you know, the cataclysmic events, which if, you know, you just fast forward today, I mean, what are the issues of today? The environment, mm -hmm. war, women's rights, you know, uh, same things. <laughs> okay. Um, you actually brought some mementos with you, your yearbook yeah. and then a book, I believe you said your father wrote? Yes. Um, uh, okay. Do you want to pick out something important or tell us a okay. little bit about what you brought with you? Okay, yeah, uh, my father's book uh, basically is about the family. It's entitled, uh, uh, he put it in uh, Swahili or something. My father's a linguist, but mm -hmm. in parentheses it says black professor. And uh, my, as I said, our family is from Maryland. Um, some of my ancestors were part of the original Morgan College, uh, mm -hmm. the founding. Uh, my father uh, happened to be, um, born in Boston, he had the opportunity to go to Harvard, and uh, I believe he's the first um, Harvard PhD in foreign languages uh, of wow. African American. So uh, he has a, you know, a real historical um, place. And the second thing I bought was my yearbook from 1971, and, um, and I'll kind of preface this by saying, <laughs> I understand that colleges are starting to eliminate their yearbooks, and of course the yearbook to us is, was like a time capsule. And basically, that's me on the inside cover, and this was taken over at the, um, at the auditorium in the basement there where they teach the, uh, there's a, there was a nude sculpture, and you know, appears to be a white female. 
So um, my classmates weren't real happy when they got their yearbook. <laughs> but the, uh, the idea was, and I think it's still relevant today, is that um, a lot of uh, American history um, was built on separating uh, black men from white females. And um, a lot of the problems of this country, a lot of the laws of the country were all, um, as I mentioned in the, uh, the Loving case, were all about um, interracial um, interactions and dating. So, um, the, uh, so that's why um, when the yearbook people asked me to pose for this, you know, I got, I got it right away. And, uh, and I think, you know, it's been, this was 1971, so it's almost 40 years. And if you really think about it, you know, it's really a lot of the same issues. Um, a lot of people say the, the quickest way to, to end a, um, a discussion at a dinner party is to bring up the subject of race <laughs> because it makes people uncomfortable. And uh, yet, uh, our, many of our problems stem from the um, segregation and the uh, discrimination that followed um, and that uh, has left um, many African Americans uh, poorer and less educated even to this day. And so so yeah, I'm, I would imagine 40 years from now, um, some, uh, unfortunately, some of the same issues will, uh, will still um, be relevant. Uh, but I would encourage uh, you all to, um, to do your yearbooks so that you'll, you'll have a, you know, a time capsule of, of what it was. I mean, I can pick out a nice picture of me when I was young, but maybe we'll stop the camera soon <laughs> <laughs> if, you want, if you want that. And also in the book there, you'll see pictures of me when I was young. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things that our teacher actually told us was that going back to the Martin Luther King assassination was there was a march that took place. Did you take place in, or um, did you take part in that march that happened from campus to, I think she said it was in her town, or the inner. Um, I may have been a, away um, when that took place. No, I did not. Um, you know, as I said, I made two trips um, mm -hmm. after the assassination. Um, but I found that um, the race relations here um, were good in the sense that it was a small town. There was not a lot of violence. There was one murder here in the four years I was on campus, and that was a bar fight that involved somebody from out of town. So you felt pretty safe compared to, say, West Baltimore where policemen get shot, you know. So I always felt safe here on campus, and, um, and I appreciate it. Uh, some of the uh, troubling aspects of that time, though, um, was um, there was a lot of rumors of cross burnings and um, uh, Ku Klux Klan activity in Carroll County. Um, and for the black students, that created a sense of uneasiness, even though we never had any confrontations. Um, I even remember the names of some of the towns associated with the cross burnings, but I don't want to mention them here because um, I don't think it's fair since I don't have any first-hand knowledge. Right. And number two, ironically, um, one of the towns, um, my, uh, my uh, men's group of my church um, goes up to the Catoctin Mountains for a retreat every year, and they stop by one of the restaurants in one of the towns here, and, and they even <laughs> the restaurant even caters them caters for the weekend, so um, I don't think it's fair to, um, to judge people by, to judge a whole town by what maybe some, uh, uh, a few people may have done a long time ago. Right. And, and also, if you think about it, there was, there was fear. I mean, 
I mean, if you were, what I noticed was if you were a McDaniel College professor like um, uh, Richard Smith and his wife, um, you know, and you have a PhD, well, you know, you're not, you're not really threatened in the economic workplace by competition from um, minorities. I mean, um, the, there are black scholars, there are black professors, but they're not a threat to your livelihood and uh, your ability to make a living. So, I'll, and also, of course, uh, if you're a PhD in chemistry, you're pretty bright anyway. So, so you're not, you know, you're not really threatened. But let's say, put yourself at the other end. If maybe you're a truck driver, or you work at the local um, Black and Decker plant, which a lot of people did at the time, um, then yeah, I mean, social change. You know, is that my job that that they're going to take? You know. Um, and, you know, you've got a high school education, maybe, and um, you're an hourly worker. So I think a lot of the fear was um, because of change, and maybe people couldn't even put a, could a, put a finger on it, but they saw change. They saw, um, you know, blacks um, coming up on the hill as students. Whereas previously, um, blacks had only worked here from Union Street uh, um, uh, to support the campus. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, well, it looks like that's all we have time for. So thanks again, Mr. Skinner, for sharing your memories with us today. Okay. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure.